morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar this morning. It's my pleasure to have everybody that is joining us. I am Indy McClymont Lafayette, an environmental journalist and development communications consultant based in Jamaica. I want to especially welcome our presenters, Dr. Marion Headley, Mr. Adrian LaRoda, and Dr. Raynor Frozy, as well as the members of the Internews Earth Jour Journalism Network team. As some of you may know, this webinar is being hosted by the Earth Journalism Network, EJN, in partnership with the Pew Charitable Trust. It is a part of a larger project that EJN is running with Pew aimed at increasing the global coverage of fisheries subsidies um, issues as the WTO treaty negotiations continue. So far, two webinars have been held on this um, topic. One has been for a global audience and another was focused on India. So uh, this um, webinar is the third one in the series focusing on um, overfishing in the Caribbean. The webinars are available on EJN's website and I invite you to visit the site for more information overall more background information on the topic. Just to also add that EJN is offering grants for journalists to produce stories on overfishing in the Caribbean and we'll be sharing some more on that in the webinar with you. Um, we would also want to encourage everyone to register for um, ensure that you are fully registered for the webinar. Um, and let us just touch on some housekeeping matters before we go any further. Each presenter will have roughly 10 minutes to share, starting with Dr. Frozy and followed by Dr. Headley and Mr. LaRoda. Um, after all three have presented, we will open the floor for questions and answers. We would like you to post your questions in the Q&A section, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see the Q&A section. So that's where we want um, the questions to, to be, not in the chat. Um, so just note that, don't post your questions in the chat, put them in the Q&A, and then I will pose them to the presenters and we will have the discussions going. We expect this webinar to last roughly for an hour, um, perhaps 90 minutes if they, conversation is discussion is robust um you know so we will see but that's a maximum we don't expect to go over 90 minutes so welcome again everybody and with that said i would like us to go into um hearing from the speakers let me start by introducing dr frozy um he's a senior scientist at the helmholtz center for ocean research um, and a Pew Fellow in Marie, Marine Conservation. He is best known for his work developing and maintaining fish base. That's a large, widely accessed online information system on fish, uh, a searchable database that has over 34,000 fish species. And that site gets over 30 million um, views monthly. He has authored or co-authored over 100 scientific um, publications on fisheries, and he will give us a global overview on the topic. So let me hand over to Rainier. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, let me start my presentation by clicking share screen. Share. And okay, so here we go. I will talk about the state of global and Caribbean fisheries and give you a crash course in fishery science and the meaning of subsidies in that context. So I start with a, an image that is published by FAO and is well known. And it shows uh, a time series from 1950 to current um, of, uh, of different productions of seafood in millions of tons. It goes up here to 180 million tons. 
but it has different categories. And uh, see, overall, it's constantly increasing. But I personally think that is uh, not the message that is really out there. Um, if you look at the categories, the dark blue and the lighter blue is aquaculture. And that includes plants and uh, oysters and what have you not, including the shells of oysters. So this is by weight. It's not really easily used food. It also includes freshwater aquaculture, Chinese carp that are not exported. So it's, its relevance for the world is limited. And what most people would think of uh, uh, fisheries is the marine fish. And that is this yellow, orange, or whatever color here. And actually, that production is declining. And that is masked by this overall graph. So if you look here at the publication by Watson and Pauli from 2001, you see the, the bold line is capture fisheries. And you see from 1988 on roughly they are declining and, and, and they have done that and continue to do that. So we do have a problem in global fisheries, catches are declining. And if you want to get a better feeling of it, please as journalists use this graph not the first one that I showed, which is, I think is very misleading. This one is from the same agency, same publication, FAO Sophia. But that shows you here, again, a time series from 1974 to 2017. But it shows you stocks by, uh, by, by classification. And you see here, the, the yellow stuff is overfished. And you see that this proportion is increasing continuously. And we have a middle section of what they call maximum sustainably fished. And by other criteria, these would also be, many of them are also actually overfished. Uh, it's only if the stock is in danger of collapsing that they put it onto uh, unsustainable. And then you have here a category of underfished stocks. And if you know, they are going towards zero. And that means in the past, you could, um, the, the, the stability of the middle section was because overfish stocks were replaced by underfished ones, but that is coming to an end. So we can expect with this one going to zero that there will be a steeper increase in unsustainable stocks. I actually looked at that in more detail some years ago and predicted that in 2020, which is last year, we would run out of new stocks. And that seems to become true by this FAO graph. Now, if I summarize this quickly, I think uh, global statistics show that uh, fisheries have drastically reduced the size of their target stocks since 1950. Global catches are declining since the late 80s. This decline is masked by fisheries exploiting previously underfished species. However, the number of such underfished species is going towards zero. And so in a way we have a problem. That brings me to my second uh, message here. And it is a quick reminder of what is called the MSY concept that stands for maximum sustainable yield and is the maximum that a, a fish stock or population of species in, in the sea can produce. And if you want to imagine that, basically you can take out something around 20% year after year after year of a certain species of conch or whatever you like and through reproduction and growth, that 20% is replenished and next year you can take it out again. So that is very nice and good. However, however, the 80% that you're not supposed to touch are there, are easily visible and can be caught and are a huge temptation to every fisher. And so naturally there is a tendency to take out more than the 20% then the stocks shrink, shrink, you get on a slippery slope towards stock collapse, overfishing, lower catches, poverty, and what have you not. Now, this has been realized long ago, and there are laws, legal systems that try to prevent that. One of them is the law of the sea. That is actually a very good law. And nearly every nation on earth has subscribed to it. So it's binding for all signatures to that convention, the law of the sea. And it, it says clearly that in your 
your uh, exclusive economic zone, you are in charge of the living resources there, and you have to manage them such that they can produce the maximum sustainable yield, meaning you are obliged legally binding not to take out more than the 20% that I managed. If you do that, then stocks remain large. You have large stocks, large fish, and good supply and stable supply and little variability year after year. If you take out more than that, you run into problems. And the law of sea also says, if you have done overfishing, you are obliged to rebuild the stocks to the level that they can produce decent catches. So it's a legal requirement. And overfishing and so on is, is basically incompatible with the law of the sea. They don't go together. And our point today is financing overfishing through subsidies. Therefore, although subsidies are not explicitly mentioned in the law of the sea, they are, they are implicitly also incompatible with it. And by the way, while I'm talking about it, so are destructive fishing methods. And you see here shrimp trawlers in the Gulf of Mexico. And you see how they bring back in suspension the seafloor, uh, mud, and so on. They bring carbon dioxide that was on its way out of the system in the seafloor back into suspension. So bottom trawling, shrimps catching with trawls is a huge problem. Now, I promised you a crash course in fisheries science, and here we go. You get your five minutes crash course. I think I have a global record on that one. Now on the X axis here, you see fishing effort. You can think of it as the, the hours that a boat is out fishing from zero to here 100, just that example. Of course, if you don't go fishing, your catch is zero. That's on the Y axis. You don't catch anything, right? And you can, you can sell your catch, then you can, can look at it either in tons in weight that you bring to the harbor or in the value and the money you get if you sell it from the vessel in the harbor. Now, if you start fishing, you get some catch and it increases and so does increase the money that you get until you reach a tipping point that is roughly the 20% that I talked about. And if you fish more, take out more than that, then your stock shrinks and a smaller stock can support fewer and fewer and less and less catch. And if you continue in building your fleet and fishing it, then you will collapse it at some point. And with a huge effort, huge cost, you get close to zero catch. And that happens in fisheries where you're actually not targeting that species, but targeting other that is bycatch. And that's, for example, sharks are vulnerable to that. If you go for tuna and have sharks as bycatch, you might wipe them out because the fishing never stops, even if they get very few. Now, the top here is the so-called maximum sustainable yield that I mentioned. And since uh, catch can be sold and expressed in money, you can compare your catch to the cost of fishing. The cost of fishing by economists is typically accepted as a linear function of your effort. So the more you go out, the more diesel you, you have to, to burn and you have to pay salaries and so on and so on. So basically your effort is directly related linear to the cost of fishing. And as long as the value of your catch this is this line is higher than your cost of fishing, you're doing fine. The difference between the two is your profit, okay? Now this is the profit that you get at the maximum sustainable yield. This is the highest catch. And if this is your cost of fishing, this is your profit. However, economists will quickly point out that this is not the maximum profit that you can get. Maximum profit, this line here is longer, is you get maximum profit with less fishing effort. Okay, so that is the first lesson to learn in fisheries economics that most politicians and others don't know and are not aware of. They think the more you go fishing, the higher will be your catch, the higher will be your income. Well, that's sorry, that is not so. Now there's one point here where the value of a catch is equal to the cost of fishing. That is the point where normally fishing would stop because if they go out fishing and even more, then basically the, the value of the catch is less than the cost of fishing they make negative. They have to bring money to it. 
right? If after a day trip out, the value of the fish that you sell is less than what you've paid for fuel, for diesel, then you make a loss and you don't, will not continue doing that, obviously. So here, it would stop and overfishing would stop there in a way, but it doesn't. Now I have some terms that I skip over, but what I want to point out is that in most fishes of the world, it doesn't stop there, but actually stops somewhere way further down, somewhere here. Most fish stocks in the world are way down on the wrong side there somewhere here. Now, how can that be? Because they would be negative and the answer is subsidies. So normally fishes would stop here, but if you subsidize diesel, say, okay, instead of paying what, one or two dollars per liter, you just pay half of that. Then in a way, they, their cost line has gone down. You have to have reduced their cost line and they continue going fishing and the stock will decline further. That is why subsidies reduce the cost of fishing, allow the fishes to go out when normally they would no, make no profit anymore. Suddenly they make profit again. So they continue fishing, they continue shrinking the stock further. Okay, I looked at some, some fish stocks in the Caribbean. How are they doing with regard to the MSY concept and the law of the sea, which is binding for all the states there. We looked at six stocks and what we found is that about half of the stocks are subject to ongoing overfishing. So that you take more out than the 20%. And the uh, FMSY is the fishing mortality, the mortality caused by fishing lark. That is just the borderline, the maximum, and it is larger in many stocks. And therefore, recent catches are mostly less than what they could be from healthy stocks. Meaning when you thought that overfishing is good because it brings in more catch and more money, you're wrong. It brings in less money and it brings in less catch is really stupid. And now the question is, if you want to repair them, how long will it take? And we looked at that and recovery time for most of the stocks in the Caribbean would be about two years. Some are already in good shape, so nothing you have to do. Some are in very bad shape, it might take maybe four years, but most of your stock grow fast and would recover quickly. Okay, so I, I recap that. Fish stocks are declining worldwide in the Caribbean. Overfishing is harming marine ecosystems. Overfishing is driven by mismanagement and subsidies. And fisheries can produce more food, more livelihood and profit if done properly. And decimated stocks, and that's an aspect that has been overlooked so far, it was not on the topic in, in the times of the law of the sea. Decimated stocks are prone to be hard by climate change. So, so you have to rebuild them all through a secure future for food security, for income and so on. You have to really stop overfishing now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Fozzi. Um, putting in context, uh, you know, the Caribbean, the, the decline in fishing here and some of the, we, we know some of the issues that we, um face with that but it's good to put it in a certain context you know the global context and i know that dr headley will add a more in terms of drilling down at the negotiating level what are we looking at in terms of the region so with that i would like to introduce dr marion headley who works with the caribbean regional fisheries mechanism secretariat which is an intergovernmental organization made up of 17 member states. She has worked in the sector for over a decade and is involved in the strengthening of fisher folk organizations and implementing the SSF guidelines through the Caribbean Community Common Fisheries Policy and its protocol on securing sustainable small scale fisheries for Caribbean community fisher folk and societies. She's also been working with the Caribbean CARICOM Secretariat to coordinate member states' inputs into the WTO fisheries subsidies negotiation. So I will hand over to you, Marin, for your 10 minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Indy. And I'm presenting on behalf of the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism Secretariat. 
Okay, so overfishing is a major global challenge and um, sustainability of the world's fisheries, health of the world's oceans and the future of the world's blue economy are under threat as a result. Um, as you would have heard from the previous speaker, fishery subsidies are an important part of the problem. They encourage fishing effort that often leads to overfishing and overcapacity. And the definition of the term subsidy within the WTO subsidies and countervailing measures agreement um, is that it, it contains three basic elements. It, it's considered a financial and all three must be present. So it's a financial contribution by a government or any public body within the territory of a member, which confers a benefit. And um, just a little context and background on the negotiations. They were initiated about um, 20 years ago and the current mandate is shaped by the 2017 declaration, which reflects um, the sustainable development goal 14.6. And the um, aim is for an agreement on comprehensive and effective disciplines that prohibit certain forms of fishery subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing and eliminate subsidies that contribute to IUU fishing, recognizing the appropriate and effective special and differential treatment for developing country members and less developed country members should be an integral part of these negotiations. The ACP group has submitted three full proposals for the three main disciplines, which cover IUU, um, illegal, unregulated, unreported um, fishing, overfish stocks, and overfishing and overcapacity. And this, this discipline on overfishing and overcapacity is the most relevant for the sustainability objective to restore and maintain a healthy level of fishing of the world's oceans. And CARICOM member states have been actively engaged through the ACP group throughout these processes and um, the negotiations which are conducted through the negotiating group and rules are in a critical phase and they're looking to have a, an agreement by, by July, mid-July. So what are some of the subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing? These cover um, subsidies to construction, acquisition, modernization, renovation, or upgrading of vessels, um, subsidies to purchase equipment and machines, um, subsidies to purchase uh, or cover costs of fuel, ice or bait, subsidies to cover costs of personnel, social charges or insurance, also income support of vessels, um, price support of fish caught, subsidies at, which cover at sea support, uh, also subsidies covering operating losses of vessels or fishing or fishing related activities. So just a really quick look at subsidies at the global level. Um, it has been estimated that in 2018, the amount of fisheries uh, subsidies provided at the global level were 35.4 billion US dollars. And of this amount, 19% was estimated to have gone to sm the small scale fishing subsector, whereas 80% was estimated to have gone to the, the large-scale industrial fishing subsector. And um, the majority of these subsidies to the large-scale fishing sector would have been capacity enhancing, sub capacity enhancing subsidies with an estimate of $18.3 billion. And um, about 7.2 billion of this was for fishing, for fuel subsidies. And it was also estimated that a fisher involved in large scale fishing operations receives disproportionately 3.5 times more subsidies than a fisher in the small scale fishing sector. And also in terms of subsidies per landed value, um, the large scale fishing sector also has been estimated to receive twice as many subsidies per dollar of landed um, catch than small scale well, product than small scale fisheries. Sorry. Okay, so how are subsidies linked to overfishing in the Caribbean? 
Um, the problem of subsidized excess capacity and subsidized excess fishing activity globally is caused virtually exclusively by others, in particular, the large scale industrial and distant water fishing industries and their subsidizers. Information about the volumes of current fisheries subsidies provided by CARICOM countries is available only in the form of approximations. And um, based on um, a study conducted in 2019 by Sumaila et al, um, and based on aggregates, the, capaci the, the capacity enhancing and ambiguous subsidies have been estimated to range from about just over 1 million US dollars to about 47 million US dollars. However, some of the, for, for, for CARICOM member states that is, but um, some of the member states, particularly the ones that have had very high estimates, they've had some concerns about how the values were calculated. And so where data are missing or values, um, you know, they would have used proxies, so rather than real values. So there's some concern there. So while no conclusive numbers appear to be available, um, we still consider that the volume of fishery subsidies in CARICOM member states is overall very small in the global context. And of course, moving forward, member states may, um, should endeavor to attempt self-examination at a reasonable granular level to really determine the amount of subsidies they are given. Okay, so in that context, the wider Caribbean region, it's um, bordered by over 35 states and territories. Um, they have diverse marine resources, very large um, exclusive economic zones. And with of these 35 states and territories, 17 are CRFM member states. And of these 17 states, 15 are also CARICOM member states. And this is just to give you a feel of the fisheries um, situation in this area. Um, so we operate in the area called um, Area 31 in the Western Central Atlantic area. And it's this darker blue area here. And this area accounts for 7% of the total capture um, with it for the entire Atlantic and Mediterranean region. And the, in this table, you can see the production average per year in million tons per live weight. And from the 1980s down to um, 2018, there has been a decline. And um, so, and you would have seen this in the previous speakers charts as well. So it's important to note that. Um, in terms of the total number of fishing vessels operating in commercial capture fisheries in CRFM member states, over a 10 year period, you would see that it started off in 2010 at just a little under 25,000 vessels with a peak of about 32,000 vessels. And it kind of leveled off at around, around that, um, about 31,000 vessels operating. Um, in terms of the operations, they are multi-species fisheries, um, they're multi-gear, and the resources are transboundary, and we have small-scale and industrial operations. The number of marine fishers estimated in 2019 was 112,262 fishers in CRFM member states, and um, approximately 2,022 no, 200,000, well, just over 280,000 um, individuals have been involved in the fishery sector, and that accounts for about 3.3% of the workforce. In terms of total marine capture fish production in meat weight and value, um, it is very valuable. Um, in 2017, the total production in meat weight was around 156,691 tons at a value of 534.6 million US dollars in 2017. And um, in 2019, this decreased to about 130, well, just over 133,000 tons with a value of um, 508.7 million US dollars. And that's ex vessel price. So no processing. 
Um, fisheries is very important for the Caribbean. 70% of the population lives along the coast. There's a high dependence on income and food from fisheries in many coastal communities. And it's also an important source of animal protein. Now, what are our interests in the fisheries subsidies negotiations and potential policy reforms? So we have various interests. Um, in terms of the offensive, offensive interests, we are of course concerned about the long-term sustainability of the resource, um, increase in resource availability or reduction of over-exploitation of shared resources by others, um, stabilization of the CPUE, um, and that the subsidy disciplines on others who subsidize more um, will reduce overall catch and hence potentially increase markets or, or improve prices for our products and level the playing fields. In terms of defensive interests, we want to avoid or limit the administrative and financial burdens that would come with the agreement. Also avoid unnecessary limitations on fisheries management, maintain space for growth and policy making, and also maintain and ideally improve access and, in, and enjoyment of shared resources included, including in the high seas, and also prevent disciplines that are incompatible with existing frameworks. In terms of systemic interests, the overall success of the agreement and the negotiations would be good for WTO, and WTO is good for the Caribbean. Um, it will also be upholding and nurturing principles such as fair and effective special and differential treatment and accounting for relevant differences between small vulnerable economies and large economies and also ensuring the compatibility of fishery subsidy disciplines in law and practical fact with international instruments relating to fisheries and fisheries management. Um, CARICOM's position on the fishery subsidies negotiations. Um, these were actions taken at the recently concluded 15th meeting of the Ministerial Council of the CRFM. And these would be ministers with um, the portfolio of fisheries and the blue economy in the countries. And they have called on the heads of, government, uh, heads of delegations in Geneva to continue to shore up CARICOM's positions on possible exemptions for subsidies to subsistence slash artisanal slash small scale fishing, also due process requirements for the IUU fishing determinations under the IUU discipline. So, you know, don't question the, the um, legal, the competent authorities within the countries. Um, and also the approach to the overcapacity and overfishing prohibition. And they have also supported the proposal put forward by CARICOM under the overcapacity and overfishing prohibition um, for exemption of CARICOM members whose share of the world capture is um, less than, and this figure in brackets, 2% is negotiable, nego can be negotiated from the disciplines on overcapacity and overfishing. And this has been referred to as a de minimis proposal. Um, emphasize that as small countries whose footprint on global fishing activities is minuscule, it should not be required to eliminate the few subsidies that it does give, uh, which are mainly targeted at resource poor fishing operators. They've also stressed that the rationale for having the de minimis proposal as a standalone paragraph, because it has not been included as a standalone paragraph in the last updated chair's text. It's not developmental, it's not developmental, but it's really based on the fact that as small countries, we have not contributed to the problem of global overfishing and, and we don't have the wherewithal to do so or the resources to do so. And also finally agreed that CARICOM as part of the ACP group will continue to vigorously pursue its interest in the negotiations by emphasizing the need for small and vulnerable econ economies, such as our states, to be able to continue sustainable exploitation of their living marine resources while placing the onus on large industrial nations to prohibit subsidies that contribute to unsustainable and damaging fishing practices. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.
Thank you, and you are doing great. These panelists have been sticking to time, so I'm happy for that. I do see the questions coming in. Keep them going, please. I note questions from Emma Lewis, Lucy Calderon, Jaffet Savory. So we will come to those in a short, but now we will take the final presentation from Mr. Adrian LaRoda. He's a Bahamian fisher who followed his um, family tradition and went into fishing. While establishing his fishing business, he struggled with the many underlying issues facing the fisheries sector in the region, such as unfair trade practices, regulation of the sector and management issues. Based on this, he organized with legacy fishers and established the Bahamas Commercial Fishers Alliance in 2009, where he served as, as his secretary. And then three years later, he was appointed president. That's the post that he currently holds. Um, um, these, his country and others were represented in the CF, CNFO coordinating unit, which was established in 2007 at the Grenada Regional Fisheries Stakeholders Workshop. And the output of that workshop promoted the launch of the Caribbean Network of National Fisher Folk Organizations, which aims to develop an ex which developed and executed a work plan for the formation and legalization of the regional network and its development. So he will give us uh, his perspective on the subsidies and overfishing. So welcome, welcome, Mr. LaRuda. Please go ahead with your presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. It's it's afternoon in the Bahamas, and I, I assume it's morning some, some other places, but happy to be here. And thank you for inviting us. Just gonna give you, I'm gonna be really brief and just give you an overview of the CNFO and the CNFO's position on overfishing and the ongoing negotiations with WTO as it affects our member, our member constituents. The Caribbean, Caribbean Network of Fisher Folk Organizations is a network of small scale fisher folk and their organizations operating in the Caribbean community, CARICOM. CNFO is committed to the realization of profitable, sustainable fisheries that are mainly owned and governed by fishers, which promote effective ecosystem-based management of fisheries resources, secure livelihoods, contribute to food security for the Caribbean communities, and increase their resilience to risk, including climate change. The general overreaching aim of the CNFO is to improve the livelihoods of Caribbean fishers. Actually, I'm on slide number two. We want to go there. Thank you. Reach of Caribbean fishers and fishing communities while promoting the sustainable use of marine resources and contribute to food and nutrition security and economic and social developments. The three areas of strategic focus from which the aims and objectives of the CNFO are developed include capacity building, policy, ad policy advocacy, and policy engagement. The CNFO comprises primarily of national and regional and fisher folk organizations with knowledgeable members collaborating to sustain the, the fishing industries that are mainly owned and governed by fisher folk. Go to slide number three for me, please. This, this slide just basically gives you the area, for those who may not know, the area that's covered by CNFO and our member constituents. They are represented by the countries. CNFO's membership include the countries represented here which is the Bahamas, Belize, Jamaica, St. Kitts and Nevis, Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Grenada, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, and Suriname. Small scale fisheries are an important source of livelihoods, particularly among developing coastal populations and deploy more than 90% of the world's capture fishes and fish workers. However, these Fisheries face growing threats such as IIU fishing, which is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, competition with industrial fleets, water pollution, destruction of fish habitats, and demand for land in coastal areas. These threats are coupled with the limited capacity of many governments to develop and support management models that suit the multi-species character of small-scale fisheries. Co-management of small-scale fisheries 
is the best response to these threats, proliferating worldwide and promotes joint management of the fishery resources by direct users, governments, and other actors. And as a participatory management model, and is able to foster the sustainability of fisheries in biological, social, and economic terms and contribute to both fisheries and sustainability objectives. Next slide for me, please. Fisheries subsidies in the Caribbean. Government's intervention with that affects the fisheries industry that does have a, a great economic value, whether monetary or, tech, or by technical assistance as Caribbean community. Fisheries are small scale fisheries with a large percentage of being rural communities combined with subsistence and commercial operations. However, in common instances, financial support categorized as subsidies may not be part of the policy framework of a government but a political framework and are therefore underutilized as subsidies may be categorized as a result of poor administration. Caribbean fisheries are classified as small scale fisheries as they, are predominantly, as they predominantly employ vessels of under 50 meters long with a major threat to the region being IAU fishing by large foreign fleets from non-Caricom nations whose operations may largely be subsidized by WTO member states this resulting in the volume of seafood and frequency of their fishing methods by which they extract, extracted by these operations, regardless of the de delimitation lines, negatively affect on the harvest of small scale fisheries that employ mostly short range, less sophisticated vessels. While most countries in CARICOM have acceded to or are progressing towards WTO membership, the rights to safeguard the interests of small scale fisheries should remain in the forefront of our CARICOM brothers as livelihoods will be impacted by the elimination of tariffs that support our country's revenue. CRFM affirms that CARICOM member states can adopt trade-related measures aimed at protecting the domestic fishery sector that contributed to overcapacity for fishing. Very short presentation, that's the end of it for me. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I think we do have, um you know, quite a bit there, some significant food for thought and questioning. Um, I will then go directly to the Q&A where we have four, I see four questions here at the moment. Um, so let me start, I think Japheth Savory had the first question which he asked, in terms of overfishing, especially in areas where government bat an eye to such, to the unethical practice, what strategies are in place to prevent such? So I would ask Marin and Rainier to um, um, comment. And Adrian, if you have anything to add, feel free. But so we would start with the question of what is in place, what strategies are in place to um, deal with overfishing. Yeah, if I may, if I may start, basically, I'm not aware of any strategies that are in place. Um, the problem is that IUU fishing is often outside of the ranges of of control and where there is control the, the problem like in europe uh, the problem is that overfishing is uh, legal in the in the sense that the countries themselves set the, the upper limit of catch that is allowed to be taken and this upper limit is already overfishing so i would call that legalized overfishing and um, they're doing a bad job for, on that the EU official number says that in 40% of their stocks in 2020, when supposedly there was, uh, they should end overfishing forever and for good, were still being overfished. That's the northern part. And in the Mediterranean, 80% of the stocks are still being overfished. And so that's really, so the answer to the question is, um, I at least, I'm not, not aware 
that there are any measures in place other than the law of the sea and sometimes regional laws that prevent overfishing. But these, these laws are not enforced. Okay, so that is really the problem. There are more issues to that. I don't want to go into licensing and so on, where again, uh, there are licenses given out to fish in your EEZ to more countries and to larger amounts than actually the stock can produce. Again, that is a country giving these licenses and amounts out without ever checking whether that will destroy the stock or not. So we really have a problem here uh, that you alerted to. And my, my feeling is there, there is nothing that stops it currently. We need something, but we don't have it. Fair enough. Um, and that point that you make about enforcement is, I know, a major one for our region. Marin, um, Adrian, anything to add re strategies in place? Yeah, I, I'll agree with that intervention. Um, there are really no specific strategies in place to prevent overfishing. I mean, in countries where you have um, management plans and you have your maximum sustainable yield, et cetera, or where the fisheries are um, not open access, um, you know, so they have their licenses, they have their quota systems, that, that's ideal, but in reality, that's not the case in many countries. So, and then there's also limited enforcement because of limited human and financial resources. So um, yeah, that needs some more attention. Fair enough. Adrian, anything yeah. to add on this? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with both, uh, both uh, panelists because I don't think that, that most country, uh, countries would have, would have the, the intention to, to, to stop or limit this practice because if if these if these uh, resources are being harvested elsewhere and then it, it eases the burden or, or put less strain on their on their own resources and and the, glo the, the global need and the global demand for a product uh, I don't believe that that any great action will be placed on any trace you know traceability programs or anything of the sort because countries just want the product and if they can get it without the hassle of having to to to, to police or regulate or, or do whatever then they, they will do that it's it's a global issue i don't think that it will be you know i don't think the world will be there for it okay okay all right um we have another question here from Emma Lewis asking, what does distance water fishing mean? And also in the Caribbean, where are the large scale fishing boats coming from? And I would, um, I don't know which one of the panelists would want to start to take that one. I, I can take, give it a shot. Um, okay. From, from our, from our, uh, information, information gathering, and our interactions through through the CNFO, we and not not to impugn any particular country, but uh, we've seen that a lot of the large ocean-going fishing vessels that 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 come into the Caribbean and oftentimes fish illegally are basically from Indochina. Um, not a lot from Europe itself, but more from Japan. And China, and and their harvesting methods, you know, they're they're trawling, they're long line, and they they you know, trawl, they do a lot of long lining. Uh, the, the practice, of course, is is seriously overfishing and deplete and and could deplete a lot of fish stocks because what they target is are migratory species, and the migratory species sometimes they would not have had the opportunity to reproduce, or you know whether you know whether they're 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 immature species or whatever, but they target those, and and so we see a lot of that, really. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Um, Marin, in, in the way, yes, go ahead. both points in a way, something uh, we're having this discussion because we think that removing subsidies is one way to reduce overfishing. Also, and it also replies to the distant water fishing fleets because it's expensive to go these places. And if their fuel is not subsidized, then all these far distance water fleets 
they make less profit and it might push them out of business. So see, one reason why we have the discussion and why we think it's so important that the World Trade Organization does something about subsidies is that indirectly by removing uh, subsidies for fuel, for example, and for other things, you reduce many, many of the problems that we have in fishing with distant water fleets, with illegal fishing, with overcapacity and what have you not. Thank you. Okay, and I think I, I'm trying to fill the questions in line with the, the feedback as well. I see one here from James Fan asking, do Adrian and CNFO support the WTO's efforts to reduce overall subsidies since they are blamed for causing IUU fishing by foreign fleets in the region? Um, and I see that Adrian would like to answer this question live. So yes, that's a question on the floor. Adrian, uh, Marin, uh, please go ahead. Yes, yes, the CNFO does support the, 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 re the reduction in subsidies by WTO. Yes, we do. Because as, as, uh, as was said, you know, these uh, ocean going vessels, when you're subsidizing their fuel, they can go, you know, they can travel anywhere. Um, I'll just point this out, that where I'm located here in, the, in Nassau, Bahamas, uh, on our Western, uh, boundaries and in, in the country on our western boundaries, there are ships from as far away as, as China that again are, are targeting migratory species such as tuna and, ever, and all that. Um, you know, so yes, we, the CNFO does support the elimination of, of the substance. Marin, um, any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, the the CR, the CARICOM's position would be to prohibit harmful subsidies. Um, but but in a way that you are really targeting the placing the onus on the larger um, industrial fishing nations, and um, interestingly enough, in the in the agreement, so you have the prohibition of these subsidies, but then the developed countries with good fisheries management systems are seeking a carve out to continue providing these subsidies once this stock is considered to be biologically sustainable. So um, yes, harmful subsidies should not be allowed, but it's, um, you have to balance it. That's our position according to the amount you're giving and, and your capacity to give the subsidies. Okay, I see a follow-up one here. If some subsidies are removed or discontinued, do, do you believe it may be possible to instead repurpose those funds for enforcement, education, livelihoods, and so on to reduce the pressure on fish stocks? Um, Rene, Dr. Fozzi, and Marin, um, or any of the panelists, please take that one. Yeah, that's... I mean, can subsidies is taxpayers' money, okay? And so that is money in hand easily that you could repurpose and give to schools and, and other needs and public health. And it is much better spent there. Um, so that is a point that uh, my colleague Rashid Sumaira often makes. He's an economist. Uh, an economist. He, he has a much better handle on that one than I have, but that is a point that he currently makes given that most countries are well short on funds to invest in very important things, why on earth would you give, sink it into a, a business that you sink further by giving it to it? That's what subsidies are doing. Now, it was stressed before that many, many CARICOM uh, countries and fisheries and so on, actually subsidies are very low, and especially uh, artisanal fisheries get very little and that that is also the experience that I have so so it's the focus is really on the industrial fleets out there on the deep sea trawling deep sea fishing long distance fishing huge net fishing they would not survive economically without subsidies and they must be targeted and there the subsidies have to be removed for the local fishers they get very little as far as I know 
and it really doesn't matter that much. I agree with you. Okay. Yeah, just to support support um, that intervention. Uh, we actually, well, following on that, we have a question from Lucy Calderon, which will, her question is, which will be the best way to ensure that small scale fishers receive subsidies and that they can use it in sustainable ways? Uh, let me give this one a shot. Okay. Yeah, part, part of the problem that we have in the Caribbean, and I'm speaking basically for, you know, through our member constituents, is that often the uh, fishers are not given support or, or grants primarily unless there's a natural disaster. Outside of that, there's, you know, part, there's, there is no established protocol or, or system to, to provide continuous support to fishers, regardless of the country that they're in. What we would like to see is that the millions of dollars that are given to the large operators, if, the, if these were funneled through to, to say uh, an organization like CNFO, you know, where these, fund, these funds would be made available for whatever project it is, Caribbean wide, then what you would be doing is then filling the void that could be left by these ocean going fleets that are traveling 4,000, 3,000 miles to, to harvest product. You can now focus the attention on, on the small scale fisheries who will then fill the void that will be left by these ocean going fleets and where you have a, you know, a, a creation of better export and they have access to export markets where they would be able to export this fish that's being caught. And that will reduce fishing pressure, not only in, in the local region, okay, but it reduce fishing pressure globally because when you target certain species, you would understand the cycle of this, the cycle of, of species reproduction. And who, who, who best would know it other than the people who are actually fishing, working and living in the region where these, where these species exist. So um, we, that's what we would like to see as, as an organization. And, and the CNFO through its business plan, you know, that we, are, we are focusing on initiatives like that. Okay, Marion, anything else to add on, on that question? Um, yes, so just remind me again, we're talking about repurposing the use of subsidy. Yes, making it more targeted to small scale fishers. Um, yes, I definitely agree with that. And, and really supporting the small scale fishers to become um, better stewards of um, the ecosystem, also supporting improved fisheries management systems um, and, and really raising the profile of small scale fisheries. Also, another important thing is because we really don't want to increase effort. I mean, we understand the stocks are stretched. Um, we understand the need to fish sustainably. And really our effort and focus now is really on improving value across along the value chain so that you are not catching more but you're improving the value and profits of what you're actually catching and processing um on that vein we well just we have another question here what well two that i think are somewhat related one another from emma lewis which asks could local or international law enforcement play a much larger role um, and we have one specifically for you, Marion, Dr. Headley, or it says, could you talk more about the special and differential treatment provision in the WTO and how that's an important piece of negotiations for CARICOM and CARICOM member states? So Marion, perhaps you can start with that one, um, the special and differential treatment, and then um, I'll ask yourself and the other panelists to touch on the enforcement and how, how that can be improved for the region. Okay, so um, the special and differential treatment, um, it, it is a cross-cutting issue for the, the, all the disciplines and all the sections of the agreement. Um, before it was a, it's a cross-cutting issue and before it had a, a, a section, but now it's kind of 
included within each part of the agreement. And um, special and differential treatment demands would be most powerful if they're based on and tailored to specific needs. So how, for example, CARICOM, we are small fishing nations. We, the between the 17 CRFM slash 15 CARICOM member states, we account for very little in the total global world catch, less than 1%. So um, that's what we're looking for as our carve out and um, it's not it's not a developmental you know position it's more you know we are really not contributing to the problem and um but now also we were looking for a carve out but in the updated text it's gone to um the the the, the negotiating negotiating text now has it if you get special and differential treatment it will be for just the territorial sea most of our fisheries operate beyond the territorial sea so we also and we're still small scale but we're we have large eez's so but they it's kind of boxing in the the exemption to the territorial sea uh, also it's looking at transitional periods so while we were trying aiming for a, a, a carve out they've now put a time limit on when we can give they continue to give the subsidies so um yeah, it, it, it's important for us to really get our, our exemptions as small and vulnerable economies. Yeah, so I hope that was helpful. Okay, I will see if we get any follow up on that. What about enforcement overall? Anything to say on that before we move to the next question? I, I could try that. Um, basically, uh, we have, we have, I mean, all, all nations of the world have agreed that IUU, illegal, un, underregulated, unregulated, unreported fishing, has to stop. But they, they haven't done much about it. But the means to do something are there. You know, we have the global, global fish watch and so on. We can follow their transponders if they have them active and see what they're doing. We can now trace transshipment. We can see illegal fishing in protected areas. And we can also do that if they switch off the electronic beep, the AIS, we can see their lights. They cannot switch off their lights really, especially not fishing. So in a way, there are lots of measures now available to stop the plunder of the high seas that we're talking about. And yes, there, there is really a role to play for an agency or something that looks into it. The other thing is really if Chinese fleets are coming to the Caribbean and fish there, well, that is a very long trip. That costs a lot of money to bring a, sh a ship there and to bring it back. So you wonder whether that would be subsidized. And, and I, I'm 100% sure it is by the Chinese government. And so here the WTO could really play a role because it's one of the few UN agencies that has a bite. They can do penalties. They can act on things. They're, just, they're not depending on consensus of all members before anything might possibly happen. No, they have a stick that they could yield. So therefore, it, this, this is a really important thing that whatever we agree on or you agree on in, in, in the WTO, is workable. You have to think of scenarios where they have to use their stick, have to be able to use their stick. And if the regulations are so lax and full of loopholes that it will never work, then all this debate is for nothing. So it's a big chance, but it has to be done right. And of course, there are some countries, I don't name any now, that have an interest in trying to avoid getting it done right. That's all I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you're not naming any countries, but the next question actually, I think, would want more detail on some of those countries. With the next question, Edmund Paul has asked is, what are the contentious issues in the WTO fisheries subsidies negotiations that are of interest to in the Caribbean region, and how are these being addressed by CARICOM countries? And, and I think that enforcement 
um, issue carry over and some of the bigger countries as, as was being raised a while ago would be part of that. I don't know, um, Rainy, if you want to touch on the contentious issues and then perhaps Marine and Adrian, if you want to add anything else. Yeah, I can just quickly, I'm not an expert on it, but uh, they sent me some of the text and I looked at it and I was actually hmm, really doubtful that will that will ever work. My response was, you have to keep it much more simple than that. If you, for example, uh, only, only subsidies to fisheries on stocks that are overfished is some of the wording. If you do that, well, then the, the simple answer by the countries would be, yeah, but we don't know whether it's overfished or not, which is true for 99% of the stocks in the world. And so they would be off the hook. See, that is one of the loopholes that I was talking about. If that is in, the whole thing is already mute. You can never prosecute them and use that WTA stick with penalties and so on. If that is the, the huge gaping loophole, first prove that the stock is overfished before you can challenge our subsidies. Well, that is... So there are issues there really that have to be taken out. Otherwise, we're all wasting our time. Um, anything else, Marion or Adrian, on that one uh, in terms of the contentious issues? No, I, I, I agree. And enforcement will always be a challenge for the, for the Caribbean states because, I mean, we don't have the resources or navies to be able to, uh, to, to dedicate to fisheries enforcement. Yet, <laughs> yet, um, um, considering all the other things that, that our law enforcement on babies, et cetera, have to deal with. So that is a contentious issue. Yeah, on, and some of the contentious issues would be, which has been said over and over again, bringing fisheries management into the realm of um, WTO uh, negotiations. And so you have the list of harmful subsidies, and but some of the bigger the bigger countries, well, there's a huge carve out for if you have um, fisheries management plan and if you can prove that the 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 um, stock or stocks are at a biologically sustainable level, you can still continue to to provide these subsidies. Um, so that's a main that's a main one um, in terms of um, the subsidies to the distant water fleet, fishing fleets, they are, there is a, a subsection to address that. So we, we think that if that, that, that's good um, because that will all, that's a cross cutting issue for IU fishing and um, the other disciplines as well. Um, yeah, so that's what I can think of at the top of my head right now. Um, you raise an issue which I had noted during your presentation, and I see it coming out as well further in the discussion that of you know our estimations of overfishing, especially in the Caribbean region. You you gave you said rough estimations at the time in terms of impact and declining numbers. Um, I see a question here from David Papana asking about. Is there any data on where Guyana stands on overfishing? Fishers have been reporting less cash catch within the past two years. I know that um, data is one of the areas that tend to Caribbean countries struggle with having the data to, to back up some of the negotiations. So can you give some perspective on where data is available, what data? that is for like journalists and so on who want to follow up on the issue. Yeah, I can, can say a bit to that. I visited Ghana many years ago, so I'm not up to speed with what's going on there. But uh, what I'm up to speed with is new methods that get, get you an idea how the stock is doing with much less demanding data than you needed in the past. So you, if, if you have decent catch time series, uh, then already we can use those to give you an idea of where the stock is. If you have decent catch per effort data and nothing else, we can use this catch per effort data and our knowledge of the species in general to give you an idea of where the stock is standing. If you have good length frequency data and if, it, if it's only from a harbor, in the harbor landing site measuring all the fish that are landed there over months or so, 
on that data, we can give you an idea how the stock is doing. So this is new. This came out over the past few years, past five to 10 years. It has been proven to work well. And so we can do that in principle. So all, all the governments or so on that are listening, there are these methods. And if you need to show something in that area, is it above MSY, is it still sustainable and so on? That can be done now with less demanding data. And I've run several online courses for, for colleagues in, in uh, Greece or China or Turkey or Philippines or uh, Indonesia and elsewhere online, which is now the, the fashion. Um, and they have been doing that and use it now themselves with their own data. So that's a bit of good news in the, all of this context. But still, I think W2A should not become a fisheries agency, should not be forced to deal with this before they can act. That's really a, a non-starter for, for them ever being able to do anything. Thank you. Marin, anything? Um... Um, in terms of regional sources as well to add? Uh, yes, so I definitely agree um, with, with um, those points. And the assessment methods um, for the data, data limited um, stocks, um, we, we, we are aware of them. We know we can have the alternative um, indicators, the sizes um, of the fish over time, et cetera. And they're really, in theory, um, easy exercises, but it's just, you know, we have data collectors that are stretched that, you know, they might start this data collection program, but they really don't have the funds to continue, like measuring on the dock and things like that. So most countries um, collect um, catch data, some effort, sometimes not, but in the case where it's a day trip, you can know, well, you have the effort in terms of hours or whatever, but, um, so another problem with the catch, the catch production, the, some of them is you, it's not disaggregated by species. So that's another problem. But um, in terms of statistics, we have a, a annual, um, the CRM Secretariat, we have an annual um, statistics and information report. So that's available online and um, the, the person who asks about Guyana could probably get some data there. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, the catches, the production by country, we have those um, with data. Okay, all right, excellent. I'm aware we are, it's 12.16 now. Um, we have four questions to go. So I would, we need to just see if we can cover those in the next 10 minutes or so, so that we can close off within our expected time span. Um, a short question here from Lucy. When will there be an outcome of the global talks on fisheries at the WTO? Um, I don't know um, who wants to take that one. Um, well, there's going to be a ministerial conference, um, a virtual one, July 15th, and the plan so they have a schedule in Geneva now and every week they're meeting to this. So there's a very consolidated draft text and they're hoping to get an agreement by July 15th, but I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but that is the goal. Okay. All right, so that's one timeline. There's a follow-up question with the data. While these negotiations are ongoing, has there been any consideration for formulating better data collection regarding the subs subsidies being provided to reduce the need for proxies in calculations and to facilitate more uniform and comparable data? Um, I don't know, Marin, Fre Dr. Frozy, I don't know, anyone of you want to touch that one? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So I think one of the good use of subsidies is to, to support research and data collection and so on. So this is also in a way a subsidy and there are fisheries actually, like in Australia, who pay for these services themselves, but in most country, this is paid by the government. And so in a, in a way it is a subsidy, but they do similar things 
for all kinds of other services. So it's okay to do it also with fisheries. I have no problems with it. These are part of the good subsidies because without data, you would never know what, what all your fisheries is doing. If you want to have any influence, then, then you need to know something. Uh, and what we're doing in Germany as a little new thing is we actually employ fishers as researchers. So we let them go out on a trip and pay them for the trip, similar to what they would earn on a regular trip. And they collect data we say, we, we, we ask them for, very simple, like of course the catch by species and the size of the fish and stuff like that. And uh, we have analyzed that and it works very well. And you can do a simple assessment that without having your own fleet of research vessels and so on, you can use the fishes directly. And that might be a subsidy, but it would be a good one. It also helps the fishers to understand and, and become more custodians of the research than just users of it. And thinking others will take care of the resource. Uh, that would also be my, my word to the fishers and to fisher associations. You have to take care of the resource yourself. Others have, have done a miserable job on it. Time that you take over yourself and look after your own business in a way and invest in your stocks. That is really your factory, if you wish. You have to invest in your production line, in your factory, and that is the fish stock. So you have to know it and have to know what to do it and how it's doing and take care of it and make sure it is producing the best value that I showed in the beginning, the best profit for you that it can. And we are in the rare situation where the best profits are in line with best stock size and best uh, environmental status. So there's no contra contradiction like in other areas in fisheries between these. Good economics is good for the species, for the environment, for the ecosystem. So we have a win-win-win situation that we have to finally make to bear. Governments have failed, so maybe fishers should take it in their own hands. But again, this would be good subsidies, uh, investing in improving the resource uh, and not investing in um, more powerful engines, more boats, more nets, invisible nets, and so on. That's not what's helping us. Um, I think, well, there's a somewhat a link to that in terms of somebody, Lucy, wanted to know who has to take a decision to repurpose the fisheries subsidies so they are not harmful. And how can fishers and citizens ask for that? So it's making that link um, between the negotiating arm and the fi actual fishers and what are the opportunities for repurposing? Marin or um, Dr. Fozzi, anybody? Yeah, so that's just to go back to uh, Dr. Froese's point about making the fishers really responsible um, for their operations and being good stewards and the operating fishing as a business. Um, so, you know, also being advocates for what they want and what's sustainable instead of just wanting money to increase their capacity, you know, managing it as, as as their business. So it's a mix of political will. So the government has to give the fishermen, the fishers, you know, that, that kind of like co-management arrangement and the fishers also have to advocate for it. So um, it's a two-way street and it, it can't really be top down because the fishers also have to show that they're capable of managing their business and fishing sustainably. I actually would pose Lucy's question here following that, Marin, and ask Adrian to take a first shot. Are there any examples of sustainable co-management of fishing areas in any of the Caribbean countries, the CARICOM countries, sorry, that could be scalable to other countries? So we want something, some more concrete models that maybe um, would be scalable and maybe direct subsidies are funding there? Yeah, so there, there are a number of them. I mean, what comes to mind right now is the, in Barbados, actually, there's about the Barbados initiative for the harvesting and export of sea urchin. Uh, that, that's business that's going well uh, um, from, the, from the bottom up, the fishers and females 
they took the took the initiative to begin to harvest and export sea urchin, and uh, to, it's a, it, it's a global push now. Then we have uh, in other instances in in Antigua and Barbuda where they are also doing squid. Again, that's a fisher initiative where they are harvesting squid and exporting it to you know to, to Europe and to China. Uh, there are a number of cases we have like that, but I agree with Marin and and and, and Dr. Po Dr. Posey where you're saying that the initiative for the repurposing of, of, of these subsidies, it, it'll have to be driven by, by fisheries ministers through CRFM, because they would have the clout to be able to negotiate a WTO. Unfortunately, in, in, our, in my view, the negotiations of WTO happen largely, for CARICOM anyway, for Car Caribbean states, largely, in the absence of any other influencer outside of finance and trade. And when I say trade, I'm not specifically referencing uh, uh, agriculture and fisheries, uh, but other trade. Um, um, in the VC more of it directed more towards uh, goods providing of, of services versus goods. So, and often the, the, the influence of, of of fisheries is absent because the, our finance ministers and our trade ministers are not are not focused enough to be able to understand that this is, should be a part of it. I'll use my country as an example on on just in this point. Our drive and towards uh, our formalizing our position with WTO was brought on because we have a lot of fishery that depends highly on the on the tax free status that we get for the export of lobster into Europe. In order to maintain that, we have to then sign on to some of the agreements of WTO. But what, the, what they're doing is trying to tailor, tailor the agreement to allow us to have the protections that would maintain uh, uh, the, the restrictions that only, that, that some industries are for, you know, for people and cannot be influenced globally. Um, I, don't, I was trying to put up a light to, to to explain that, but um, I guess in the, the absence again, the, the, the focus has not been the, the, well, the story and the narrative has not been driven by, by fisheries at all, you know, purely by, by ministers who, who, who have no interest in or little interest in, in fishery. So ministers of fisheries are going to have to be the ones who, again, through CRFM, to direct the, direct the narrative for the repurposing of, of those subsidies to be able to support. Um, while you were speaking, I was thinking through, you know, the, the issue of awareness of some of the fishers. Are they really aware of the WTO? Um, the negotiations and how they can feed into the process. So that's one thing that I'd like to put out there. And just to remind everybody that, um, you know, we're starting, we want to start a, con a broader conversation outside of the negotiating mechanism, which is why we're having this webinar where journalists and other um, social media, the, can really take up the issues and, and share on a broader level. As we're about to close, um, I would just, this is the last question that I would um, take from Joseph Sav Savoy, Savory, sorry. I would ask um, each panelist to give their thoughts or opinion on the question and also any final parting remarks um, before we close. So the question, questions are, when new policies and practices come about, is there a designated body that gathers information and distributes it to countries who may be slow in their information gathering? And also if a country has missed, consecutively missed targets and has a high demand, what can be done in this case within the collective body? So those are the two questions. Um, Marion, I don't know, do you want to start with the one about a designated body that, that would take up new policies? Any thoughts on that in the region? Yeah, okay, so I really, I'm not really sure what, what I don't follow the question. 
Um, okay. So it says if some trees in a country has consecutively missed targets and has a high demand. Um, I, in regards to what? But I'm and, not, yeah. I'm that one needs a little clarity, yes. What about the final one about when the policies and practices come into play? Anything on that? Because I think that would be you guys that would um, gather the information. Yeah, and so we, have, um, we are the competent um, agency for the um, Caribbean community common fisheries policy. So um, we have a Caribbean Fisheries Forum, and we have the Ministerial Council, and we have annual meetings, and we also have special meetings. So um, all these things are on the table as they come up. Uh, we provide updates to the technical people and the ministers on an annual basis, and the reports are available online as well. And then, of okay. course, at the national level, um, the fisheries authorities are responsible for the sharing these kind of policies in collaboration with the appropriate ministries. So, with um, yeah. So, and just to go back to Adrian's point, you know, before the negotiations were more the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade people, but within recent years, we have been actively engaged. The fisheries sector has improve their engagement in the negotiations and advising the um, negotiators. Okay, thank you very much, Marin. Um, Adrian, Dr. Fozzi, any in 30 seconds, any closing um, comments because it's 12.30 and we have to close off. No, I, I think uh, Marin explained that very well. The regional fisheries organizations uh, are the ones that would inform their countries they also have some uh, mechanisms if, if a country violates what has been agreed in the uh, regional body, they can reduce catches, allowed catches for that country in the future. It's rarely done, but there are some mechanisms like that. And so, so that would be what I could think about. Adrian, your 30 seconds as we close. Yeah, no, I just want to thank you for the invite and I look forward to more discussions like this. I've actually learned a couple of things today. Uh, and for those who may be questioning, don't mind the necktie. Yes, I am a fisherman. <laughs> 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 but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. Very informative. Okay, excellent. So with that, I would like to thank everybody for their participation, for spending the first part of World Oceans Day with us in this webinar. Um, just to remind you to share what, if you've learned anything, we do have a, a questionnaire. You can look in the chat for the link. Just a couple questions, your feedback on the webinar that would be helpful for us in planning future webinars going forward. For those journalists who are interested in doing more stories on the fisheries, which we are strongly encouraging because we want Caribbean people to understand what is at stake, what are the key issues. You know, the grants are open and you can visit the EJN's website for more information on that. And so I would like to just thank everybody for participating. And I do hope that we can do play our part in advancing the dialogue going forward. So thank you very much. The thank website, you. the recording of this will should be available on the website as well if your persons want to um view afterwards thanks everybody thank you bye-bye <laughs>